Hello world, this is Lisa Fredrickson, your friend and computer science professor. And in this short screencast, we're going to debrief on exercise 2-3 from the end of chapter 2 of Muroc's JavaScript and jQuery textbook. Because this application is so similar to 2-1 and 2-2 that you've recently finished, and which I debriefed in separate screencasts, I'm going to use this one to remind us all of the key terminology that needs to be solid before we move into chapter 3. Let's just see what this application does, and then we'll debrief on the concepts. I'm going to launch in Chrome. The application asks us to enter the length. I'm going to put 100, enter a width. I'll put in 50, and then it does a calculation for area and perimeter if we have sides of 150 on opposite side. Now let's look at the code. Because JavaScript modifies HTML and CSS, it's extremely important to be solid on our HTML and CSS concepts. For HTML, we absolutely need to know the terms element and attribute. An element is technically the opening tag, the content, and the closing tag. So this entire line would be an HTML paragraph element. Here's a script element, a main element, the body element. Everything that you see and probably discuss as a tag is actually an element in HTML. The attribute is found in the opening tag and further describes the element. For example, this attribute, lang, has a value of en, which declares to the web page and the browser that the language being used on this web page is English. And that just helps the browser render your web page faster and more correctly. I have also included an embedded style sheet here. We know from best practices that we like to take our CSS and our JavaScript and put it in external files to separate our concerns. But for convenience sake, I've added an internal style sheet here so we can talk about the three E words in CSS. And that is selector, declaration, and property. Those also have to be solid before you move into chapter three. Selector in CSS is what comes before the opening curly brace. It makes sense because it selects what the styles mean. So in this case, all four of my styles are selecting the main HTML element. And there are many different types of selectors, including selectors that apply to HTML elements, selectors that apply to HTML IDs, and selectors that apply to HTML classes. And so all three of those types of selectors must be solid at this point in your vocabulary. The entire rule, the style, is technically called the declaration. We have four declarations here in our style sheet. And I would encourage you to code each declaration on its own line for readability. Finally, we have properties. Width, margin, background color, and padding are all the properties. And then, of course, what comes to the right of the colon is the property value. Moving on into our JavaScript, the key terminology in JavaScript be able to successfully read the book and to be a successful JavaScript programmer starts with the word object. And fortunately, in the beginning, we only really have three objects to worry about when we're applying these little examples to a little web page. And those three objects are the window, which is the entire browser itself, the document, which is actually the web page itself, what we're doing on the web page, and the console, which is our best friend because it shows us JavaScript syntax errors as we're running our JavaScript. And it's also a place where we can log out the value of variables as we're running our code. So those are the three objects you need to worry about right off the bat. You also need to know the word method. What is a method? It's something an object can do. For example, the window can prompt you for a value. The window can alert you with a message. So we've learned about window.prompt and window.alert, methods of the window object. On the document, we have used the right method because we've written text to the web page. Now that's not a very professional way to get our content on the web page, but we'll deal with that later. For right now, it's a good example of using the document object and a method that's available to that document object. We can write on the document. And of course, console, console log, which is my favorite. And typically after I declare a variable, I console log it out because I want to know what is the value of that variable and be sure and so I'm using console.logs typically after every variable declaration statement just to keep my head in the game. Now, if I put simply a variable name in the console log methods argument, and we know this is a method because we see the parentheses and whatever you put in the parentheses is the methods argument. So I need to add the word argument. It's what the method uses to 
complete its task. When I put a variable name into the parentheses of the log method for the console object, it's simply going to log out that variable value. And let's experience that console log. If I refresh my page and enter the length of 100 and my width of 50, I see my console logging out those two values because I've asked my code to log out the value of the length and of the width. I sometimes prefer to be more verbose about it, so I'm really clear. If I put length in quotation marks, remember quotation marks in JavaScript means I'm inserting a literal string. I literally want the word length to appear, not the value of the length variable. And I can use a comma here to separate the two. And for this console log, I'll do something slightly different. I'll say width colon quote and then the concatenation operator. And whether you put spaces before or after your operators is up to you. I like to put spaces on both sides of my operators. I think it just reads better. But I'll save that page and refresh it. Enter length 5, enter width 4. And you can see how my console log information is really valuable when you combine a little bit of text with the variable name. The last two things that I want to be solid in your system before we move on to chapter three are what is a variable in the first place? Well, a variable is just a storage location. It's a temporary place that we've given a name where we're holding a value to be processed later. And so we're declaring the variable length. We're assigning it to the value of whatever someone types into the window prompt that's going to state them enter length. And then we are making sure that it's a floating point number and console logging it out. We're doing the same with width. And then we have two more variables down here where we're assigning them to area to the value of length times width. And we're assigning the perimeter variable to the value of two times length plus two times width. When you see an equal sign, if you can say is assigned to I think it will make a tremendous amount of sense to you, especially down the road when we start comparing things to see if they're equal to each other. So if you look at that equal sign and say is equal to, it will get confusing later when we're actually doing an equality comparison. Right now, the equal sign is not like it was in your algebra class. We are not working on a teeter-totter algebra type of situation here. We are saying length, you are assigned to this. Now length, you're assigned to the parse float method applied to yourself. One last thing, why this solution has two script tags, I am not sure. I would put all of this JavaScript in one script tag and probably move it all down here into the body of the web page. Later on, we're gonna learn that we're gonna wanna take all of our JavaScript out of the HTML. Similarly to how we strive to take all of our CSS and put it in an external file. An external file will allow you to reuse that JavaScript on multiple pages and makes it easier to maintain in the long run. Thank you.